Okay. Hello, California. Welcome to this webinar for the Cal South Soccer Coaches Association. My name is Robin Russell, and I'd like to introduce you to the host for tonight's webinar, Mr. John Bilton. Uh, John is a very experienced, experienced coach, uh, both in the UK and Turkey. And tonight, uh, you want to sit back and uh, he'll give you an insight into the report he's just authored on the World Cup. He's got, he's got PowerPoints, he's got video, he's got uh, diagrams, he's got downloads for you. Um, John has a very distinct Yorkshire accent, which I'm sure he's very proud of, um, and he'll take questions as we go along. Um, to do that, you need to get onto Twitter uh, and uh, go to at CalSouthSoccer and the hashtag is World Cup lessons. So uh, I'm now going to hand you over to John. Uh, as I say, keep those questions coming in, and, and John will take you through it. Uh, so we're going from London as we are now up to Sheffield to John, and there he is. So John, over to you. Hi, Robin. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you're all well. Um, we'll get along with the presentation. Now we switched over there. Yep. Okay. Right, here we go. So, we're here to try and learn some of the lessons from the World Cup report from our experiences. Um, contributors to this report, there were quite a few. The major contributor was a colleague of mine, Dr. Peter Usher, who's based in, in Canada. Um, and he, he did a lot of the detail analysis, uh, which has been ongoing for quite a few years now in our project on evidence-based coaching. And we had analysts who were actually, they're all coaches. Some have not done any analysis work before. Um, so it was a relatively new experience, but we guided and we got quite a lot more data than the what's in the report. So those are the guys, as you can see, USA, Canada, England, uh, Australia, Uganda. The content of the report is, as I say, is based on the Sports Path World Cup report. Um, and the findings that we, we came up with show very little difference to previous World Cups and also to our other research uh, right through to youth level. So what's applicable to the World Cup is certainly applicable to youth football, which uh, many of you will be working in. Um, so there's that, a key thing to bear that in mind. There's three key areas we're going to focus on. Firstly, we're going to look at strikes and goals in an area that we've defined as the goal zone. Secondly, uh, we're going to talk about delivering the, the ball into the goal zone from delivery zones. And thirdly, we're going to look at transition of possession from the defensive and middle thirds and then into the attacking third and then hence into the delivery zone. So we've got a sequential approach to, to this, uh, this three key areas focus. As we go along, we're going to look at the basics as evidence-based coaching, so hopefully it will get you thinking and then get you started about how you can gather data and how you can use the data to start to influence the way that you coach. So we'll be looking at the implications for coaching as we go along. So the first, uh, the first key thing is strikes and goals, the goal zone. That is the area that we defined as the goal zone. How did we come against that? Well, probably going back to 2009 and 10 and 11, we started plotting strikes and goals around the, in and around the, uh, the goal and uh, the, out, the, the strike location of strike outcome. And we found out that the majority of the goals are scored in that area. Hence, we call it the gold zone. Now, 80% of all goals were from strikes inside this area. That's that's an average throughout what type of football you may look to consider. Round about 80%. 
some get as high as 95% of goals scored in there, the top teams at any level. So obviously, if there's 80% scored inside the goal zone, the other 20% are scored outside the goal zone, which is a big area because goals can be scored direct from corners. They can be scored from strikes in these areas here, just inside the attacking third. They can be scored from these areas, just inside the penalty area. But that, those are averages. These 80%, 20% are average uh, right across the board, but we don't want to be average, we want to be above average. Taking Germany, um, they scored in the World Cup 88% of their goals inside the goal zone compared with the average of 80% and obviously 12 goals outside the goal zone. Let's look at the strikes. In the World Cup, the average was 35% of all strikes were inside the goal zone and 65% were outside the goal zone. So don't be average. Germany, 56% of the strikes were inside the goal zone and 44% of the strikes were outside the goal zone. So if we look at it from two perspectives here, in the red there, outside the goal zone, 65% of the strikes produced, 20% of all goals are to scored outside the goal zone. So 65% of the strikes are contributing to 20% of the goals. Inside the goal zone, surprisingly, 80% of all goals come about by just 20% of all strikes inside that goal zone. The elite teams, and in this case, uh, in the World Cup report, we'll say Germany, what we call elite teams are teams who frequently can score three plus goals a game. Inside the goal zone, Germany had 56% of sole strikes inside there, and it produced 88% of the goals. So you can see a big difference between elite and average. In terms of outside the goal zone, 44% produced the 12% goals. So you can see they reduced the number of strikes outside the goal zone, and they've increased the number of strikes inside the goal zone. Would there be any questions at this stage? John, yeah, there's a, there is a question from uh, Lee, Lee Hancock in Laguna Beach. Are you suggesting that, uh, you know, it's wrong for players to take strikes from outside, to take shots from outside the goal zone? No, we're not suggesting, we're not suggesting that at all, actually. Um, there's occasions where, uh, say for instance, uh, the goalkeeper punches out and it clears outside the goal zone, outside the penalty area, and it's a regain. So he's being confronted by um, he's being confronted by three defenders and he's no option other than to take a strike. You have another scenario where a player is running through, and then. Um, having running through on the through ball, having the team work really hard to gain possession of the defending third. Uh, they have a passing sequence or deliver a direct great ball onto a player uh, and they work really hard in getting the ball into the attacking third and then the, the, the striker goes for glory, uh, very egotistic approach and he has a strike from long range. Okay. And all right, all right, John. Go back to your presentation then, now, John. Okay. Bat on. Are we there? Yep. Okay. Right. So, moving on. Let's take the leading goal scorer in the World Cup, James Rodriguez. Now, so we're looking at individuals as, a pro, as opposed to to. Uh, teams. Rodriguez had 16 strikes in the World Cup. 10 of the strikes were 
outside the goal zone, just six inside the goal zone. And yet he had five goals out inside the goal zone and one outside. So he's eighty-three percent of his goals were scored inside the goal zone, and they came from just thirty-seven point five percent of his strikes. Now, if you look at this is the strike locations and outcome graph that we did on, on Rodriguez, along with a lot of the strikers. And you can see the yellow dots is where he scored his goal from. Five goals inside, one on the outside, which is what one that he took on his chest, and he, uh, and he hit it on a volley from outside. The, the purple ones are the block strikes. So you can see that the majority of his strikes were from outside, and uh, they were really non-effective in terms of hitting the target, and or scoring goals. Um, if the team, the coach had been more aware of how important it was with a player like Rodriguez to get the ball into the goal zone, then their, their playing philosophy and team shape would have resulted in more balls being delivered in there to Rodriguez, get more strikes and consequently score more goals. And maybe they could have gone on a, a, a bit more to one or two more knockout phases in the uh, in the competition. This is Muller's uh, strike locate strikes and locations, and you can see here he had 75% of his strikes inside the goal zone, compared with Rodriguez at, at 35%, and he got 85% of his goals in there. So you see, it it, it, do, it makes a crucial difference. Uh, getting the ball in there, particularly to your best strikers, and then leave it up to them. Not shown in this detail, but uh, the average the average for the elite strikers um, is that they will they will score from uh, less than 1.5 goals a game. But sorry, for every 1.5 strikes on target inside the goal zone, they'll get a goal. Outside the penalty area, it may be as high as one in 12.5 in on target. So, John, you're saying for the, the elite strikers, uh, every three strikes in the goal zone, they get two goals? Correct, yes. And that, that will be elite at youth level as well. All right. In the elite. Okay. If we look at the, the goal locations, we split the goal zone up into three, the three areas, as you can see. 24%, that's 31% of, of goals scored in the goal zone, uh, 31 of the 130 goals scored in the goal zone in open play were scored in P2, 43% in P1, and 33% in, in G. So you can see most of the goals were scored in, in area P1. So what are the implications for coaching on that? Well, firstly, uh, we need to consider, we need to be planning to create 50% plus strike from inside the goal zone, particularly in P1, as opposed to 20% of strikes inside the goal zone. In order to do that, we need to practice strikes from inside the goal zone, particularly from deliveries into P1 which amounts to 43% of goal zone goals. And we'll talk about delivery shortly. And the thirdly, we need to reduce the strikes from outside the goal zone. So those, those are the three major implications for coaching. And John, you, you could plot, you, we've got a download on the, uh, on the site for this. They can download a, a little um, template you've done and, and the coaches can actually plot their own strikers and where they have their strikes from yeah that's right that's correct Robin and, uh, and could I just ask another question there John about would you therefore suggest that it's far better to, 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 to have shooting practices in and around the goal zone rather than I don't know the traditional shooting practices which would be all would all be belting the ball from outside the penalty area well, yeah. I mean, if you if you going go back to Rodri going back to uh, Rodriguez's um, 
if we go to back to Rodriguez strikes there, right? Now you might say to his coach or any other coach, you could ask on a workshop and you could say, right guys, there's there's a strike locations and outcomes of a, of a top striker, no need to name names. You've missed a lot of strikes, there's a lot of strikes blocked from outside the goal zone. What would be your what would be your implications for coaching him in, in relation to getting more goals from this player? Now, invariably, from my experience, coaches will say, well, it's obvious we need more long-range shooting practices, right, and fall into that trap. The correct answer would be, well, we need to plan to get more deliveries into the goal zone and we get the player inside the goal zone because that's where he's deadly accurate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. So, moving on now to the second key area. So, we've now we've established how important it is to get strikes away inside the goal zone. Let's have a look at the deliveries into the, into the goal zone that we call goal zone delivery zones. Throughout over the years now, we've established these zones by where balls are delivered into and we give them names. Um, and what we found from the World Cup is that there was 1,378 deliveries, attempted deliveries into the goal zone from all these areas. Surprisingly, uh, from all the, that high number of deliveries, there were only 328 successful deliveries. Now, let's just define successful deliveries. Uh, the ball's played in from any of these zones. Yeah, if a player gets on the end of it and has a, a one-touch finish or a one-touch header, then that's successful. Or if it's the, the player gets a, a knock-on, a head-on, that's turned as successful. Or if it comes into him and he lays it off first or second touch to somebody else inside the goal zone, then that could be turned successful. So it's a, a successful delivery is a possession delivery. So... As you can see, from all the deliveries into the goal zone, there was only a 24% success rate, which is which is one in four. Now, I wouldn't be happy with one in four, but uh, most people are. Um, what we found out that the reason why it's low is because these are the preferred delivery zones. This is your standard crossing zone from the edge of the box up to the goal line in that area outside the penalty area. That's the standard way of delivering balls into the goal zone. Corner kicks and from what we call the wide attacking zone from the edge of the box up to the, up to the attacking third. From our research from the World Cup, and it's no different from other research, around about 60, 60 to 70% of all goal zone deliveries are from these three zones. That's the flavour. That's always has been uh, the way of delivering balls, crossing balls into the box. Surprisingly, though, in the World Cup, these account for just 39% of all successful deliveries. So we're using methods. So we're using these three methods for 66% of the deliveries. Yet we're only getting 39% success on getting deliveries into the goal zone. What we've identified is the the two most successful delivery zones of what we call the central attacking zone, penalty box width out to the attacking third, and what also two areas inside the penalty area which we call the box pass zone because it's a pass inside the penalty box. This accounted for just 25% of all goal zone deliveries from these two zones, yet they accounted for 47% of all successful deliveries. So, of all the 130 goals that are scored inside the goal zone, 48% of them, nearly half of them, came from these two delivery zones. 
So really, uh, these two zones are key. Okay, so that's a quarter of all deliveries really produce half of all successful deliveries. This just gives you some examples of a team I was working with in Turkey at Fenerbahce uh, of box pass goals, which highlights that even at youth level, it's, uh, teams are quite easily capable with practice of delivering balls into the goal zone from the box passing zone, from the box passing zone and how economically it is to do that. So a player there, he could have crossed from the crossing zone, drives in, passes it to back, across back the box, and a goal. Here we have another player away. When he gets to that position, he could strike, but he's trained to pass it back across in the box passing zone and gets another goal. Win the ball back in the attacking third. Defending thirds of transitions on here. He's played there again into that key zone, plays it back across, and we score from there. Notice how that we plan to attack to get the man and the ball into the box passing zone rather than cross it from out wide. So that's those are examples of, of box passing uh, box pass zone goals. These are examples of central attacking zone goals. These are under 14s, U14s. Under 14s, these, yeah, yeah. So the ball's passed inside these under 18s. Ball's passed down the side of the striker into the goal zone and it delivers from there. Another example here. These are under 15s. He could have had a long range strike there but he knows better <laughs> and there again we play so that that's goal scored centrally from deliveries into the goal zone or even or players running into the goal zone with the ball dribbling or running in and taking the strike with the goal zone from the central attacking zone so uh, just to summarize in this section those are the key areas And if we look at percentage of attempts there from uh, the crossing zone compared with the central attacking and the and the uh, box pass zone, these are the three favourites within the game anywhere. Thirty percent taken from the crossing zone compared with thirteen and thirteen from these two zones. Possessions. There's only 14% possession of the possessions come from the crossing zone, 27% from there and 20 from there. And successful ones, you can see there's a high amount of success of conversion from uh, those two areas as well. If you look at the elite in Germany, You look at their 50% of goal zone deliveries were from the box pass, 63 successful, successful, and 63 successful from the central attacking zone. So that's so that. John, just to hold Germany there, then you would say that Germany style of play um, discourages them to cross the ball from the wide crossing areas, um, but does encourage them to. Um, manufacture a way to get the ball into that central attacking zone so they can put it in the goal zone and also uh, to get it in that uh, box passing zone so they can uh, pass it across into the goal zone yeah you're right yes yes well, as you as you watch matches watch matches on the television or watch them live uh, if a team's if a team's into getting three goals plus these they will work really hard at getting balls cut back into there some call them cutbacks that really work harder getting getting deliveries and players into there so it can be passed across. So it's an easy finish. You can see why with an easy pass across or an easy through ball that you can get a goal for every 1.5 strikes on target. In fact, some of the elite strikers are nearly one-to-one. -one. 
there any questions at this uh, at this stage? Uh, we've got one from um, Ron Aston, uh, a coach in San Diego, John, who says um, that the, the type of finishing that uh, you would need to use in the goal zone, is it mainly um, one touch, is it uh, volleys or half volleys or headers, uh, what sort of finishes uh, normally does the striker need to uh, practice in the goal zone? Well, he needs, to, he needs to practice relative to the type of delivery. So if it's a box if it's a box pass, then usually it's a finish with the inside of the foot or the laces, uh, because uh, generally box passes are on the ground. Although there may be some box passes in the air, it may be a clip back to the four post, and it might be a header. But invariably, one touch finishes. Eighty percent of all goals are scored with one touch finishes. Uh, in terms of deliveries in here, it. As I said earlier, a player might run the ball in there or dribble it in um, between defenders. So that would be one way of practicing. But there again, it would be passes passed on the ground. But but we might have a delivery set up from here, just inside the central attacking zone, and it might be clipped in into this zone here. So that might be one into chest or and down and finish or the header, etc. But generally speaking, uh, one touch finishes inside of the foot all aces. Okay, thanks, John. Now, this this is just showing an example of where you could actually um, start to plot your deliveries into the goal zone. Um, we've got them coloured out here. You can get get a copy of this. We've we've got this set up, and what you'll see on in this little example. Uh, I we put a P2 in here and underlined it because it was not a possession delivery. No need to put the hour in. I'm just showing that the the the, the final delivery is from this area into the P2 area. So that will be one way of monitoring it if you so wish. Uh, here it gets into the box passing zone, cuts it across into G. Uh, there's no underline, which means it was a successful delivery. And if you also want, you can circle it to define you've had a, a, a strike for a cross if it was a goal or whatever. So this is one way that you can start to monitor uh, where you're delivering into the goal zone and this, the outcomes of the deliveries. Um, we could, you can also use this same template that we put up there for plotting your strikes, where you're taking a strike and what was the strike outcome, etc. This is obviously if you haven't got match analysis software. If you've got match analysis software, well obviously you'll need to plot these, you'll, you'll need to plot them as you look at the video anyhow. So, so implications for coaching uh, from delivery from these. Delivery into the goal zone from the box passing and central attacking zone are crucial if we want to set up a high number of strikes from inside the goal zone. Right, the final one then. Uh, what I call uh, purposeful possession. Um, these are possessions won in the defending the middle third and also in, in the attacking third and then get in an attacking third possession in there. Now, I ask many coaches and many players, why do you pass the ball? And you get all sorts of answers. Well, we pass the ball to keep possession, or we pass the ball to keep it away from the opposition, or we pass the ball to keep time, or we pass the ball because we like passing the ball. Well, really, that's not the answer. You pass the ball to try and score goals. And if your possession is purposeful, then you pass the ball to get the ball into the attacking third with possession. And then from there, you deliver the ball into the goal zone, either by a cross or whatever way. Now, your philosophy might be play direct and get, get it as early as you can into the attacking third with possession. That's your philosophy, fair enough. Don't get tied down into detail here. You can see this from the report, but this one shows uh, where the goals were, were scored from. Uh, 
from possessions gained in the defending third, the middle thirds of which we define as middle third defending, middle third attacking, and the attacking third. So you can see 23% of all goals in free play, that doesn't include penalties, that's 36 goals were scored as a result of getting a transition in the defending third. 16 and 17, around about 36% were, were from possessions in the middle third, and then 42% were from possessions gained in the attacking third. So this shows that um, it's crucial that you have a philosophy uh, and a style of play that gets you the ball from the defending third into the attacking third with purpose, with possession, and therefore allows you to deliver the ball into the goal zone because goals are there for the taking from getting the ball there. Same John, would it, John yeah? would it be fair to say, based on those figures, that 60% of the goals are scored when you regain the ball in the opponent's half? Correct, Robin. Yes, exactly. Yes. Um, which is, so it, it's crucial. Now, it's crucial if you're going to regain the ball in, in the middle third or into the opponent's half, defensively, you've got to be organized to do that. So attacking play is about defending, winning the ball, uh, and then a, a quick transition, uh, particularly if the, if the opposition is unbalanced, um, from the middle third. You have to be able to defend in the middle third. So for me, um, if I was to do it starting this, or we started early, like most coaching courses say, well, you start working on defending up front, then you work back to the middle, then you look at defending. For me, this is the area where you need to learn to defend effectively first, and uh, because that's where the majority of the goals start from in this area, in the, in the opponent's half of the field. So, these are typically elite performance standards uh, by Germany, but uh, the, the standards that can be achieved even by youth team because it, it, it's all relative to the opposition. So what Germany scored in these percentages in the World Cup, it, you, can, you can achieve this with, with players. From possessions gained in D and delivering into A, which is the attacking third, Germany was successful with 55% uh, of their possessions gained in D and delivering into A. Now that could have been a direct pass or it could have been played through midfield. So, John, are you saying that half the time the, the Germans got the ball in the defending third, uh, they managed, uh, every other time they got the ball in the defending third, they managed to get it into the attacking third with possession? That's right, Robin. Yes. That's, that's phenomenal, isn't it? It is. Now, bear in mind, if you look at the report, what we highlighted, there were two key ways of doing that apart from in open play. One was through the goalkeeper's distribution. Um, and you can see that in the report, we haven't got time to go in that. And the other one was some throw-ins. People don't, don't understand how important throw-ins are in getting possession and helping you to get the ball into the attacking third. The goal that Germany scored in the World Cup, they had a throw-in round about here. Um, they threw it to a guy, the guy was going to get it switched, switch play. Uh, he, he got fouled, so they took a quick free kick, and they did what they would have done with the throwing. They switched it across the back. If you remember, the attack down the left side gets into here, delivers, and a goal. So that won them the World Cup. Germany, uh, in the World Cup final, had 16, from memory, 16 or 18 attacking third possession entries from throw-ins. They had around about the same from... Uh, from the goalkeeper distributions. So it's crucial to get a high number because they're all the work at it. Um, you just got the middle third uh, entries there, John, sorry. sorry yeah, sorry, yeah, Rob, just a moment. Um, well, it, 
There we are, right? So that's the middle third. So 80% of the time that Germany got the ball in the middle third, they were able to deliver it into the attacking third with possession, yes? No, that this is just deliveries, Robin. All right, okay. We're going to look at, at we're going to look at possession deliveries now. Teams who tend to play direct, they'll have a high number of entries into the attacking third without possession compared with, with possession. What we find out, the teams that can play and, and have a 75 to 80% possession success rate in the attacking third uh, have a high number of attacking third possession entries. So, deliveries into the attacking third with possession, 32%. Compare that with 55%. So what we say now, the Germans, one third of all entries gained in the defending third ended up in the attacking third with possession. In terms of middle, 60%. This 60% is a common figure we found in youth football. Uh, we found it in the Champions League in the EPL, in the La Liga, Barcelona, Real Madrid, it's averaged, the average round about 60%. So that's a, that's a very good um, performance standard to try and achieve. This shows you an example here of a, a throwing uh, with the ball in the defending third. These are under 17s. Let the ball run across him. That's a reverse throwing. Switch the ball out the other way. There again, drives into the box, crossing zone. Little regain and in. What you'll see from the report is that uh, there was a high number of entries into the attacking third from throw-ins that, that, that were played and switched away from the throwing zone. Teams who threw the ball down the line or threw it into the, into the throwing zone were not very successful at getting uh, entries into the attacking third from the throw-in. So um, throw-ins are very important to be organised at throw-in. It gives, you, gives the players a higher number of possession entries, so it's crucial with the young players to be able to uh, coach that and be successful at it. How can you plot that? Well, there's various ways how you can start to monitor that. You don't need video, you can do it live, particularly if there's an assistant coach or a player or a parent, whoever, and you could use this approach. This diagram is, is in the package for you. Uh, this team's one possession here, so I will put, and they've lost it in the defending third, so I'll just put a DD. There's no need to put a, a line, I'm just showing that for demonstration purposes. If they win it in the defending third and lose into middle third, we put a DM. If, for instance, they win it in the defending third, get it into the attacking third without possession, then we put DA. If they win it in the middle, lose it in the middle, we put MM. And also, if they win it in the middle, and get it into the attacking third with possession, then we will put that. So if you do it on there, or you can just, if you so wish, well, that's an attacking third one, uh, and retain possession with it. If you wish, you can use this, this method. You can use just scoring cards on a sheet of paper. The key thing is really to just to work out your percentages and see where you're actually losing possession of the ball. If you're losing possession, a lot high, per high percentage of possession in D to D, then you know that's where you need to focus on. If you get the ball from D and you're losing a lot of your possessions in M, or if you're winning it in M and you're losing it in M, you know there again, you, your weakness is middle third. So. It gives your coaching a purpose and then if you work with purpose and from the evidence you've got and you keep monitoring it you can see how successful your coaching uh, your coaching is in terms of being effective of purposeful possession.
Another way, which is I feel is a better way, um, it's a better way because this is actually a timeline analysis, really. Uh, these are the possessions. You've got this in your pack as well. You can see possession one, the team game possession in D, lost it in M. All right, that was it, end of story. The next possession, we won possession in M, got, got it into the attacking third, put a one in there because they got attacking third possession, and then they got a goal zone delivery from the crossing zone. Next third possession, uh, won it in M, got it into the attacking third with possession, had a central attacking zone, through ball into uh, in, with possession, delivery into the uh, into the goal zone, and they scored a goal. And then the fourth presentation won the ball in A from a regain, retained it, got a kept possession, and the inside the goal zone they had a they had a strike off target. So. Possession by possession here, you can see where you're actually on a timeline it's actually taking. So this is a better way of doing it. Now, if you haven't got this, if you haven't got video in it, uh, if you haven't got match analysis software, one or two neat little apps uh, used for, uh, from Apple, I suppose there'll be someone if you don't use Apple, that you can use there again to uh, use your iPad or your iPhone and just... Uh, monitor this quite effectively to give you some some quick data that you can start um, evaluating um, your coaching effectiveness. So, just to finalise, implications for coaching. Firstly, it's our belief over a few years now of, of having evolved an evidence-based coaching program um, that you must coach to produce strikes inside the goal zone. Monitor your coaching effectiveness and bearing in mind that strikes from outside the goal zone are, uh, we're not saying don't take them, but generally they're a very inefficient way of trying to score a goal. You should what we found out that teams that have a lot of strikes from outside the goal zone don't have a plan when they get into the attacking third. The player sees the goal and he'll hit it from anywhere. There was loads of examples in the World Cup of that because they don't have a plan uh, in the attacking third. Secondly, coach to produce possession deliveries into the goal zone from the central attacking and the box passing zone. Crosses from outside the penalty area, there again, are inefficient. Now, we're not saying don't do it. There may be times when it's got to go in because there are no other option. But what I tend to do uh, with our teams, if I mean, I'm working at presently with some under 12s at a professional club. And if we find we've got the ball in the corner, in the crossing zone, uh, the players know not to cross it, but to but to keep possession and come out with it and then try and get a delivery into the box passing zone or into the central attacking zone. So it develops their players' ability to keep the ball, be aware and go in where it really hurts and it's really more effective to deliver it into the, into the goal zone. Finally, why do we pass? Well, we pass to achieve entries into the attacking third with possession. So working on winning the ball back, particularly in the middle third, and being purposeful with your possession and getting into the attacking third and then delivering into the goal zone for a strike inside the goal zone is, is the way to go and the way to be getting three goals plus a game. Not every game, but it will contribute greatly to scoring three goals, developing young players, uh, and developing coaches, understanding of how to win matches and how to produce players who know how to win matches.
That's it then, guys. Have you got any? Have we got any questions? John, yeah, I mean, a couple of questions from coaches uh, about how can they get further information. I think you've got a slide on that, John, haven't you? Yes, sorry. Um, just a moment. Because I think, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, right. So, what... What we've done, uh, we've produced a second edition of a book called Analyzing the Soccer Player. Um, this deals with uh, a, a player rather than a team, but it's all relative to the team. Um, there's a lot of information in there um, on the same theme, really, particularly on strikers and playing the ball into the goal zone. So that's one way of getting 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 started. In there, there's quite a few practices on strikes with inside the goal zone and deliveries into the goal zone. Um, we're also working on three more books on this series. One in, in team play in terms of strikes inside the goal zone. Another book on deliveries into the goal zone, and a third book on purposeful possession. So myself and uh, my colleague, Dr. Peter Usher out there in Canada, uh, we're, we've got quite a lot of ev a lot of evidence now over four or five years, uh, not just the evidence that, that um, practices that we know work. And these practices, we've, we've analyzed our match play following a run of using these practices. And over the years, it's evolved what we call the evolution of the revolution. <laughs> John, um, thanks very much for that. Now, um, to get that book, they go to that website. Uh, it's an e-book. How much does it cost, John? My book, it, uh, it's, uh, I think it's $749, uh, something like that. It's on the iBook store. Okay. So it, it's less than $10. Um, uh, this particular um webinar will be up on YouTube and we will promote the web address for that on YouTube. Uh, they can also, John, email you and uh, if perhaps you could go back to that slide, John, and just so that people have got your email. Um, John, are you happy that if people email you about any of the aspects that you've uh, mentioned tonight? Well, certainly, Robin, yes, yes. Um, so, um, a couple of ways to follow up. You can... Uh, you can look at this particular webinar again on YouTube. Um, you can look uh, to contact John at his email down there, johnbilton at mac.com. Uh, you can have a look at his website and see uh, if you'd like to buy that book for less than $10. Uh, and we also have a um, LMA School of Football Management course on evaluating teams and players, which John actually has also contributed to. Um, and I'll put the details of that up on the um, on, on the YouTube website. You can also get discount for that uh, via the Cal South Coach Association. Uh, so, John, um, we've uh, we've had almost 50 minutes. We're uh, just about run out of time. Can I can I thank you very much indeed uh, for your time, John? And I know you spent a lot of time putting that presentation together and putting the videos and everything together. Uh, really, is first class stuff. Uh, Thanks very much indeed, and as I say, if you have any questions for John, please email him, and he'd be very happy to deal with them. Okay, thank you, Robbie. It's my pleasure. Thanks very much, John. And ladies and gentlemen, for listening. And thank you. Good night, Bye. 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 Bye.